Well, thanks to all of you for being here tonight. Uh, this is the time uh, for the reading on the President's War, Six American Presidents and the Civil War that Divided Them. If you are here for water harvesting the desert, you need to come back Tuesday at 7.30. <laughs> Uh, first of all, thanks uh, to Changing Hands. This is the third event we've done together uh, over the past three years. I did my official book launch uh, for both of my books here, uh, both Founding Rivals and Congressman Lincoln. And thanks so much to C-SPAN Book TV. I think it's amazing that you can turn on the TV on the weekends and just watch TV with authors talking about books. I think that's fantastic. And this will be the fourth time I've been on the program. So if I manage to get through this hour without saying anything inappropriate, they'll broadcast me for the fourth time, which is uh, tremendously exciting to me. So this is my third book, The President's War, Six American Presidents and the Civil War that Divided Them. For me, as a history lover and a history junkie, which is what I was for many years before I became a history author, this is the ultimate story that has never been told. Uh, we had a record number of living presidents during the Civil War. Martin Van Buren, J uh, John Tyler, James Buchanan, Millard Fillmore, Franklin Pierce, a record number of presidents alive to witness America's national tragedy and to plague, harass, aid, and oppose and advise President Abraham Lincoln. So for me, this story began uh, with a conversation with a friend of mine named Rob Peck. And he mentioned something about Martin Van Buren in the Civil War. And Martin Van Buren, not somebody you ordinarily associate with the Civil War, with the, the mid-19th century. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, that guy was still alive. Five of them were still alive. And I knew instantly that I had the idea for my next book. And so to tell the story of these five presidents in the Civil War, it was hard to figure out exactly where to start. And so I honed in on uh, a dinner that was given early in the administration of President Andrew Jackson and the first secession crisis that the country faced. So the idea of nullification was plaguing President Andrew Jackson. The idea that a state could veto or refuse to be bound by a law with which it disagreed. So in this case, we're talking about the tariff, the tax that is placed on uh, goods that come into the country. It was a boon for northern manufacturing, which eliminated uh, foreign competition. But it was a burden on southern agriculture, which was largely an exporting economy and that relied on low tariffs and free trade in order to uh, be successful. And so South Carolina was threatening to nullify the national tariff. And some of the nullifiers uh, decided to make their stand at a dinner in honor of Thomas Jefferson, the titular founder of the Democratic Party. And so this should have been a big night for celebration. The Democrats were in the ascendancy. They had elected their first official president, Andrew Jackson. They had so much to celebrate. The country was prosperous, uh, but this issue was dividing them. And so the, it, by protocol, the organizers of the event would give their toasts. And then following the organizers, people would give toasts in order of their station. So all night, Andrew Jackson is sitting there, not one to suffer fools gladly, and listen to the organizers of the event give toasts, cheering nullification, cheering uh, the idea that states could, could ignore federal law at their, at their whim and whimsy. And finally, it came to Andrew Jackson to show his cards. And so Jackson, as a southerner from Tennessee, is a strong supporter of states' rights. The nullifiers expected him to give up and give a favorable toast. This is not what happened. He got up and he said, the union, it must be preserved. No qualifications, no ifs, no ands, no buts. The union must be preserved. And in the words of one senator, it fell among the nullifiers like an exploded bomb. Next in order was the vice president of the United States, John Caldwell Calhoun from the state of South Carolina, and the leading exponent of the doctrine of nullification. He gave the next toast. And he said that the union was dear to the hearts of Southerners, but only next to their liberty. And so, uh, given the South's peculiar definition of liberty, uh, it was a remarkable <laughs> statement. But uh, the union next to our heart, uh, most dear, uh, but next to our liberty, uh, less important. Third in precedence was Martin Van Buren, Secretary of State of the United States, who got up and said, let's remember this country was founded on compromise. America itself was a compromise, the Constitution a compromise. And let us always remember that it is compromise that has kept us together 
through various crises in the past. And so I thought that was the perfect place to start because it's these three ideas. The union, it must be preserved. The union next to our liberty, the most dear. And let's remember compromise has always kept us together. These are the three philosophies that clash, combat, and compete in the antebellum era that will not be resolved until an armed conflict that claims 2% uh, of the United States of America's population. So uh, the Jackson administration uh, came in with, with big hopes, but it also had a congenital defect. And it seems like such a, a ridiculous thing uh, to divide the government over. It was something called the Petticoat Affair or the Eaton Affair. Uh, Jackson brought some friends with him to DC from Tennessee um, and one of them uh, that he placed in his cabinet had married a woman too closely uh, following uh, the death of her husband for the likes of John uh, Calhoun's wife. And so this scandalized certain quarters of Washington uh, and this woman and her husband were excluded uh, from the various parties and balls and social functions in the national capital. Martin Van Buren at this point is a young widower and so he has no wife to pull him into this dispute on one side or the other. So it's very easy for him to support uh, the president and support <coughs> the Eaton family. Well this ends up dividing J the Jacksonian cabinet so badly uh, that Van Buren ends up offering his resignation as Secretary of State uh, in order to allow Jackson to pick a new cabinet um, and to uh, start over, start fresh, realize the promise of his administration. And so Jackson, very reluctant to throw his friend under the, under the proverbial bus, packs off uh, to England, uh, minister to England, very important, prominent post uh, at that time. So Martin Van Buren goes over there to England, finds out one day that the Senate has rejected his nomination, and that two senators, Henry Clay and, um, Henry Clay and uh, Daniel Webster, had conspired to create a tie vote so that John Calhoun as vice president could actually stick the knife in. And Calhoun was only too happy to do it, to defeat Van Buren's uh, nomination. Now this did not go precisely as they planned. Uh, in the words of Senator Thomas Hart Benton, who heard Calhoun crowing about his vote immediately after the fact, he said, you have broken an ambassador made a vice president. And that's exactly what happened. Calhoun is dropped from the national ticket. Van Buren is added to the national ticket as Jackson's running mate and becomes the heir apparent uh, to the presidency. And so uh, the legacy that Andrew Jackson leaves for Martin Van Buren uh, is not a great one. Stop me if you've heard this one before, uh, but an abundant availability of credit had led to land speculation which overheated the housing market and caused the national economic collapse. <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, we have learned from these mistakes and, and would never ever repeat them. <laughs> so poor Van Buren, from the early hours of his presidency, is plagued by the first national economic crisis and trying to figure out what to do. Then as now, presidents get far too much credit and far too much blame when times are good and bad. Uh, Van Buren is defeated. Uh, in 1840 by uh, a famous ticket uh, which was famous uh, for the slogan Tippy Canoe and Tyler II, William Henry Harrison, the first nominee of the Whig Party. Now the Whig Party didn't agree on very much. They agreed that they didn't like Andrew Jackson, uh, which was a uh, good enough basis for them. They didn't even bother to adopt a platform uh, at their 1839 convention. Uh, they knew that they had the Democrats on the ropes and they were going to, to win this race as long as they could stay together. So some Whigs had come to the party over states' rights uh, because Andrew Jackson had ultimately stared down South Carolina in the nullification crisis and gotten them to capitulate with a uh, threat of the use of force. Um, some of them had been angry over Jackson's policy regarding the National Bank, where he had withdrawn the bank's deposits and vetoed the bank's charter. Uh, but for whatever reason, they came together as uh, the Whig Party. William Henry Harrison, hero of the Battle of Tippecanoe, famed Indian fighter, uh, and uh, John Tyler, senator from Virginia who had sparred with Jackson and voted to censure Jackson over the issue of his removal of deposits of the bank. Uh, it was a brilliant campaign. It was the mid-19th century equivalent of the 2008 Barack Obama campaign. All kinds of new innovations. Uh, the age of Jackson had increased the suffrage uh, throughout the United States. More people could vote than ever before, more people could read than ever before, and there were all these new mechanisms for reaching voters. Now we saw party newspapers and newsletters. And